This is a story that I, if I remember right when I read through it a couple of weeks ago, it's kind of sad. So get your handkerchiefs out. Uh, I, I think I'm remembering this as the right story, but I'm going to read it anyway. And we'll get it out of the way first. Back in October of 2008, I was 28 and I was in love. I had known her my entire life, but I didn't realize how I felt until after she moved away from Ontario, Canada, where we lived, to British Columbia. By the time I realized that she'd taken my heart with her, it was too late. Now, 12 years later, thanks to Facebook, we had reconnected and she was coming home for a visit. I felt like I'd waited a lifetime for that day to come. I'll never forget how beautiful she looked when we met. Time passed too quickly. Days turned into weeks and we spent as much time together as we could. Before we knew it, she would be leaving in a week and I knew I couldn't let her go again. And to my surprise and great joy, she agreed to stay. Thanksgiving week of that year, we arrived in British Columbia to get her things and officially move her back home. We flew in. After spending a few days with her friends, we had a four-day drive back home. Everything went well until the second day of our return trip. We got lost. How did I make this mistake? I wondered as I stared out over the landscape. We were almost out of the mountains by then, but it was getting late. I thought maybe if I drove a bit longer, we could make up some ground. It was a thought I would soon come to regret. Night was falling fast when I saw a sign that indicated the next town was 60 kilometers away. Dear God, another 60 kilometers. But I'm already so tired, I thought. Being the stubborn type, I pushed on. I can do this, I told myself, like the little engine that could. No sooner had I formed that thought than the first raindrops began to fall. I glanced upwards and whispered, How much more are you going to put me through, Lord? Ask a stupid question. I tried to set aside my frustrations. The love of my life was sleeping comfortably in the next seat to me. Even though we were lost at the moment, we had our whole lives ahead of us. I was a lucky man. And one day we would look back on this night and smile, right? Five minutes later, the rain was coming down pretty steady and we were no closer to finding our way back to where we should have been. One second, we were traveling along the lonely road while the wiper blades swished away the rain almost as fast as it blurred my view. And the next, a pair of massive antlers appeared in my path. It was a moose, and then another, and then another. They were being chased by something I could never have imagined. I slammed on the brakes, but there was no time to stop. It was out of my hands. The tires slid across the wet pavement and crashed into the animals. The world spun wildly as my car flipped over and over and over again, landing on all four wheels. I don't remember being ejected from the vehicle, but I awoke to find myself lying on the ground being pummeled by the driving rain. I had been knocked out at some point, and breathing hurt, but not breathing wasn't an option, and I gasped for air and winced at the pain with each breath, and then something growled. The memory of the last image before my foot buried the brake pedal came back to me, and it growled again, followed by a sort of wailing wah sound. The pain and shock of the accident was overwhelming, and as a former hockey player, I wasn't a stranger to the feeling. No one plays hockey without breaking something at some point. But this pain felt like it was coming from every part of my body. And then I remembered my girlfriend. No, God, no, I cried. I couldn't pull myself up, so I had to inch around to the other side of the car, crawling on my belly. It was an eternity during which I pleaded with God to let her be okay. As I rounded the passenger side, I saw her body on the ground 30 feet away with something strange standing over her. At nine feet tall, the hair-covered being looked like an ape man with shoulders as wide as my car. Get away from her! I screamed at it. Leave her alone, please! 
Through my yelling, I heard a strange wah wail again. Now I knew what was making it. The creature went down on all fours like a gorilla would do and placed its hands on my girlfriend's belly. And it wailed that wah again. And I couldn't understand what this thing was doing to my girlfriend. I just wanted it to get away from her. Leave her alone, I screamed. I grabbed a piece of broken fender intent on throwing it at the beast, but my arm was broken and it wouldn't do what I wanted it to do. All I knew was that I needed to chase this thing away before it hurt my girlfriend any more than she already was. I wanted to hurt it. I wanted it to feel the pain I felt. It stood up and released a long growl before taking one long hop and landing right next to me. With the ease of a child setting aside a discarded rag doll, it scooped me off the pavement and it set me on the side of the road. It seemed to realize that I was hurt because it didn't drop me. It placed me. Then it went back over to my girlfriend and carefully picked her up, cradled her in its arms like a newborn baby, and brought her over to set her beside me. I was trembling in pain and fear as I looked into the face of my girlfriend. She wasn't awake. Her eyes were half closed in that terrible way that said there was no one behind them now. And I turned my gaze back to the creature. We locked eyes for a moment and I saw compassion there. I burst into tears, crying out her name over and over, unable to bear the physical pain or to understand the mental anguish. I was angry at the world and frustrated with my inability to fix this, and all I could do was cry. All the while, the strange ape man stood over me and patiently waited, and finally it spoke, not in English or anything like a language I ever knew or heard. It wasn't yelling now. It knelt down and placed a hand on her leg and looked back over at me. Somehow, I think it knew that the love of my life was gone. Lights were coming from somewhere in the distance and darkness fell over me. That was the last thing I remember until I woke up in the hospital. Police were all around me and my mother had flown in from Ontario along with my brother. They were in the room. My girlfriend's mother was there too. An officer with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police said, Sir, you were in a terrible accident. I want you to try to be calm now. I looked at my mother, hoping against hope, as I asked the only question I needed to have an answer to. Is she... did she make it, Mom? The look on my mother's face told me all I needed to know. I spent the next three months recovering. My leg required 62 staples... My arm, wrist, and several ribs were broken. The official police report doesn't include the part about the Bigfoot. I left that out. It wasn't until five years ago that I shared this with anyone. At that time, I sat down with both my family and hers, and I told them everything. I had to get it out of my system. Keeping it hidden was making me sick. I worried that people would laugh at me, but bundling up inside was worse. I look back now and I can imagine that the Bigfoot was chasing the moose and they just happened to cross the road at the same point we were. I don't harbor any hard feelings toward these creatures. He showed me empathy by placing my girlfriend beside me one last time. Now, this story doesn't have a happy ending, but I hope it will encourage others to share theirs. Keeping it inside does no good. I've wanted to give up many times since that awful night. The images and memories are always with me, but I keep moving forward, trying to live my life as best I can. I think my girlfriend would have wanted it this way. And I don't think that requires any commentary from me. We'll just leave it like that. I'm sorry to the to the uh, man who wrote this. Sorry you lost your girlfriend. Uh, it's, it's been since 2008, and uh, it's been a little while. So I hope you're doing okay. Thank you for this uh, heartfelt story. 
another podcast. Welcome to the Dick's Cryptid YouTube channel, where all we do is tell weird stories. That's all we do. I hope you enjoy it. All right, here we go. This is a story about a UFO. It's really, really good. In 1993, I formed a UFO discussion group in Eastern Kentucky, which by unanimous membership vote became the Kentucky Skywatchers. Unbeknownst to us, the group was joined or infiltrated by an undercover FBI agent. He was enthusiastic about the topic and was a pretty vocal participant in our discussions which could get heated at times. There were no obvious signs that he was a government official. He was pretty good at hiding his FBI affiliation, which I suppose is part of the job description, if you think about it. When he stopped showing up for meetings, I wasn't surprised. In these types of groups, people come and go. We later discovered the cabinet where the membership forms of the group were kept had been accessed, and some of the files that contained names, addresses, and phone numbers had gone missing. One of our members was a woman who claimed to be psychic. She was actually quite a character, and once she started telling one of her many UFO encounters, we let her have the floor. Now, we were open-minded and offered such people respect and a measure of dignity. She swore that somewhere near her home in eastern Kentucky, that there was evidence of activity inside the top-secret underground weapons laboratory stationed amid the long and narrow mountain ridges. She sensed strange vibrations, portraying herself as the eyes and ears of an alien race from a distant galaxy. She cautioned us that an invasion was imminent, but it would not be an obvious one with advanced weaponry and spaceships visible in the skies. Rather, she insisted the invaders would seize power quietly through manipulation of our infrastructure. They're going to control us through our banking institutions, she warned. It was an elaborate scenario she painted, and I have to admit that partway through it, I started to lose the plot. Being psychic, or so she claimed, she must have sensed our attention spans were waning. She reached for her purse and from a side pocket pulled out a stack of photocopies and she passed them around the room. It was basically her lecture on paper. She gave us all ten minutes to read through it and collected back all the copies as if they were classified documents. As the meeting concluded, I bagged up a coffee-stained cups. The woman leaned over to me and she whispered, I think there's a plant from the FBI here. Her skills weren't good enough to pinpoint which one of us it was, though. Perhaps our soon-to-be rogue undercover FBI agent was the one after the meeting who walked the woman to her car, where they engaged in an intense conversation. It was the last time I saw either of them. A few weeks later, I received word that the woman had been killed in a single-car accident down some remote road near the mountains. I only knew her through our group, but all of us were shocked by her sudden death. Shortly after that, I was visited by two FBI agents who asked a lot of questions pertaining to the members of our UFO group. At one point, they produced a photograph. It was a man from our meetings who had escorted the woman to her car that night. Instead of being dressed casually in jeans and a hoodie, as I remembered, the man in the picture was sporting a suit, not unlike the two agents who were questioning me. The nature of their inquiry implied they were looking at this man as a murder suspect in the death of this poor woman. Well, I told them what I knew, which wasn't much. It was a hot topic at our next meeting. People in our neck of the woods aren't real enamored of the government, especially when they show up at your door asking questions. We must have entertained a hundred conspiracy theories before we adjourned that night. I closed down the group after suffering some financial setbacks. I lost my job, which started a snowball that eventually resulted in my house being foreclosed. I was audited, and the accountant I employed couldn't produce any of my records, 
And in the aftermath, it strained my marriage and I ended up in a costly divorce. I borrowed enough money to keep my vehicle, although the interest rate was exorbitant. My credit was shot and I held on, but barely. I'm older now. My life is much simpler these days. I live modestly in a one-room apartment, and I prefer to pay my bills in cash. Each night before bed, I study the aphorisms I keep inside my Bible on the nightstand. and I've learned to read around the coffee stains from when I stashed them in the garbage bag on the night that poor woman and the rest of them weren't looking. Oh, that was a, that's kind of a spooky story, and it's a creepy conspiracy type story. Like there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of espionage going on. I don't doubt this story one bit, one bit. And she saved some of the documents that she, uh, that she had in her meetings. And so they're not all gone. She's got a few. But this was very interesting. Uh, it's not like an encounter story. It's a, it's an experience story from someone who looked into some of these strange things that happen in our world. And, oh man, these are these are awesome and thought-provoking. But thank you to the person. I can't tell by the name if it's a man or woman, uh, which is no problem. But thank you to the person who sent this. I thought this was brave, and it was a very good story. Thanks. Okay, here's a Bigfoot story. The writer doesn't say uh, to use his name or not, so I won't. In 1985, I was a volunteer scoutmaster in a wilderness hike to Bear Lake in the Im immigrant wilderness of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. We were east of Sonora near an area known as Strawberry, California. Our group consisted of me, three other adult leaders, and 11 boys, counting my son. The forest is thick in that area, in the Sierra Nevadas. It's a beautiful country with well-established trails, steep granite cliffs, and huge boulders inhabited by abundance of wildlife, including deer, mountain lions, and black bears. There are also the usual night creatures that crawl into tents with boys who don't listen when told not to keep their food in their tents. They never cause serious damage, but they're always good for a scare. We'd made it halfway to Bear Lake on the first night, and we set up camp at Camp Lake. The trail there is 50 yards wide, and it runs for 300 yards from west to east along the south end of the lake. There is no trail along the north side. It's covered in thick trees and brush and swamp, and it's not passable. Even the deer avoid that side of the lake. The boys were old enough and experienced enough to pick where they wanted to pitch their own tents. I set up my tent about halfway across the lake and 15 yards off the trail. After getting up early and loading up the horses and driving for three hours and then making a long, steep hike, I was ready to get some rest. I made my supper and I turned in at 8 p.m. I worked on a ranch, so sleeping for five hours and getting up early was a part of my normal daily routine, but at 1 a.m. I was wide awake. I climbed out of my tent and looked at the stars. Without the light pollution, they were a beautiful sight. It's one of those things I look forward to seeing most when I'm in the mountains, and I built a small fire and I put my coffee on to cook. I was sitting there thinking that life couldn't get any better than a good hot cup of coffee cooked over a fire on a cool night in the mountains when I noticed my horse raise its head and look to the west. I looked over in that direction, but there was no moon, so I couldn't see anything. And since I couldn't hear anything either, I just let it pass. Minutes passed, and then I did hear something. Brush was cracking and limbs were breaking and something on two feet was bulldozing its way through that impassable terrain on the north side of the lake. It was only 50 yards across the lake, but even with my flashlight, I couldn't make out who or what was so noisily bashing its way through the tangled swamp on the other side. Now, there are no elk, buffalo, or other large wildlife in this part of California. I don't think it scared me, but I was concerned. Whatever was out there was evidently large, and I had these boys to look after. 
There was no doubt that it was bipedal, and it was clearly large enough to break some sizable limbs. The creature continued on to the east until I couldn't hear it anymore. My horse was visibly shaken, and it was snorting, and I was dumbfounded. I don't think I ever mentioned it to anyone. I don't remember giving it any thought after that night. Not until 2007. Several years passed, and I had developed quite an interest in Bigfoot. A friend and I had driven to a remote part of Oregon known for its Bigfoot sightings, While we sat on the mountain miles from civilization, my friend suggested that I try to do one of those Bigfoot calls we'd seen on television. Well, I did my best, but I doubted that I'd get a response. So imagine our shock when 15 seconds later, we got an answer from a mile to the east. And 15 seconds after that, we got another one from the southeast. We stood there staring at each other. We were unable to speak. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And then one night in 2007, I was relaxing on my couch and watching a Bigfoot documentary. Dr. Jeff Meldrum from the University of Idaho was talking about the research he had done. He mentioned that he had been making regular trips to the immigrant wilderness since 1974 and had Bigfoot sounds plaster casts, and a possible sighting at exactly the same spot where I was camped with the Boy Scouts that night. Well, I was utterly amazed. I'm not saying it was the same Bigfoot I heard that night, but I can't help but wonder if it is part of the same clan. Oh, very cool story. Sierra Nevada's uh, up into California a couple of times. My son was in the Marine Corps. We were out there. He was in Southern California where all the desert rats live. (laughs) That's what he called them. But uh, it's actually a beautiful part of the state. Uh, It's uh, the inhabited areas. Sometimes they're kind of junky, but uh, it's, uh, if you get, if you get out of that, man, that desert is so cool looking, especially the Joshua tree area where those trees grow. But uh, anyway, we were out there and we took, uh, we took a trip into some mountains we went to sequoia national park and there's some park up there called big canyon or canyon state park or something like that we went there and we went somewhere else is that the sierra nevadas that's what i'm getting at i can't remember if we've ever been up in the sierra nevadas but i don't think it was because i've seen pictures of the sierra nevadas and where we were didn't look anything like the pictures i've seen But anyway, it was, uh, you know, one thing I noticed about California, it's like the air is, it breathes different. It's, uh, I live in a real humid area. It's a low elevation area. I think we're 300 feet above sea level here. And it's a, it's a real humid area. And sometimes it's kind of stuffy to breathe. Uh, to me in the wintertime, in the summertime, it's real oxygen rich to me because We are kind of a semi-tropical area in the summertime and everything is so green and growing. And, uh, but I remember about California, how even in the higher elevations, it was easier for me to breathe. It's like, I don't know, the air's thinner. Uh, it just seems to like inhale in your lungs easier. I don't know. It's really weird. I don't really know why I'm talking about that, but you know me, if it pops in my head, I'm going to say it. Um, but anyway, this was a very good story. This was a scoutmaster who had an experience and then it was almost confirmed a few years later. So I enjoyed this story. I appreciate him sending it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate you. Maybe you could subscribe or at the least come back and watch the next one. Click the, Click the little video you're seeing right there on the end screen and listen to another one because these are all great stories. I really appreciate you guys and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.